Greetings from Podcastville. The Church of What's Happened Now is brought to you by On It. Start the new year off fucking healthy. You made resolutions like a fucking Mama Luke, didn't you? Now you got to follow up on them. Start with a little alpha brain, a little shroom tech sport. Give mama a stab and give you some more oxygen. A little shroom tech immune. Take care of yourself. It's a whole new fucking year. As Tony Soprano said, be a good friend to yourself. Go to onit.com right now and press in. Church. Bam! And get 10% off delivered right to your crib. Now, since we're starting the new year off healthy, you also want to start the new year with a clean asshole. Let me tell you something. <laughs> the, the fucking internal system, it starts with the fucking muffler first. Once your muffler gets all fucked up, it eats you from the inside out. And the next thing you know, you're walking around with a tube. Why? Because you didn't wipe your ass and you left that little peanut on your ass. Then the skin grows over your ass and now you got fucking problems. That shit ends today. Why? HelloTushy.com is here to rescue you. Joey, what's Hello Tushy? Hello Tushy is a portable bidet you put in your favorite bathroom at the house. And after you take that fucking shit of debt, you put that fucking water on, it sprinkles your ass so oh, you hear Mexican music, even though you're fucking French. <laughs> you might be French, and all of a sudden you start hearing Mexican music when that water hits your ass. You wipe it down with a little antiseptic, forget about it. Your muffler's clean, ready to be licked. You understand me? Go to hellotushy.com and press in. Muffler. Boom! And get 10% off right now. Start the year off healthy and start the year off with a clean asshole, all right? Kick that fucking mule, Lee. What? Happy fucking New Year, you dirty fucking savages. I love you. We made it another fucking... Can you believe we made it another year? Did you wake up on the first going, what the fuck happened last night? I didn't do dick for years, <laughs> Eve. I stay on my mind, my business. I don't want to see nobody. I want to talk to nobody. I don't want to get no fucking ear beatings. Jimmy Two Shoes Schubert's in the house. What's up, baby? Happy New Year. Direct from fucking Philadelphia. My man, the Christ Killer, Hello. got his dick sucked on New Year's like a doctor. Look at him. He's all ready to go. Look <laughs> yeah, he called me, and I was home alone. He's like, you got to do something. So I, I told him, you're 30 years old. I give my pinky to be 30. I'd be out there mingling, oh, getting fuck. chlamydia. <laughs> That'd be on my fucking uh, resolution oh. list. New Year's Eve. Don't jinx me. Acquire chlamydia. Yeah. That's get some yeah, thirty wounds. years old. He wanted to stay in and watch fucking. Uh, what were you watching? I watched Inside Man. I like that. Yeah, movie. I watched an Inside Man. I forgot how good that that was in this movie. As soon as he said that to me, I almost went over there and dick smacked you. <laughs> you're thirty years old. Go take a hit of coke or something. Do something. You can't stay in the fucking house when you're thirty. I Me, mean, I'm fifty six. What the fuck do I give a fuck? Yeah, it's uh, those days are going out. You know, I'm just like I'm over it. You know, it's like amateur night. Everybody comes out. And I was actually surprised. Like more people weren't like when you were out there doing the clubs. You know, it's always a good night. But I'm surprised. I was re most people were relatively behaved. You know, some people just in the years past, you get hammered, just throwing up in the audience. <laughs> I don't know why people start the new year off like that. You know, you like, know people. People really don't know you're young. <clears throat> you know, people have these New Year's parties. They start at six. Yeah. You don't know. You do two bumps of coke <laughs> at six thirty. You're off and running by nine o'clock. There ain't no stopping you. You got fish lips. You don't even remember the fucking bell going down. You don't remember <laughs> nothing. Yeah. And that's what happens to people. I and, I and listen, I'm guilty. Guilty. I think I did it one year where I got whacked, and then I didn't. I didn't like getting high on New Year's. I thought it was bad luck to be high. I didn't want cocaine in my nose on the yeah, clock. Yeah, well, because it's a new year. You got new opportunities. You got new things. And it's like, but I'd snort my ass off on the first. Yeah. <laughs> then on January 1st, during one of those bowl games, I'd be snorting and whacking off, banging one out. But it's so weird how, no, like New Year's never really. Uh, and in comedy, I think they torture the fucking consumer too much. And I don't like that. Yeah. I want a comedy club patron to have a good experience. Absolutely. And there was one particular year that I was working that never went out of my mind, and I felt bad for the consumer. In my world, I'm not supposed to think of the consumer, but I don't like getting ripped off. None of us as consumers like getting ripped off, so I'm not paying double for a fucking comic I could see. Yeah. So you give me a shitty piece of salmon that comedy club salmon, it's got eyeballs and shit. <laughs> Six eyeballs and it's brown skinned, you know, or a steak at a comedy club. I'm not doing it. Like, yeah. that's the dumbest fucking thing in the world. That's like going to a strip club and ordering salmon. The guy's got pubic hair falling on it and fucking stripper juice. And, you know, I, it, it just doesn't make sense to me. I don't, I, I, I always think of the consumer. How yeah. would I feel? 
you know, years ago, I got a call from uh, an ex-girlfriend of mine, years ago, and she said she was going to see Jay Moore, and the club she was at was the worst thing ever, that they treated her like a piece of meat. Yeah. And I always thought about that. You know, I've always thought about how people think, as much as I have no empathy a lot of times. People might not think I'm empathetic. I'm very empathetic. I remember working with a comic and me going up to him as a feature act and being a fan of his. Right. Like wanting to be that guy and going up to him and going, there's a bunch of people outside that want to talk to you, like 11 people. And he goes, fuck them. And I was like, that, that's a mental note that I'm not going to have that attitude. Absolutely. If I get to that level. I don't get it either. There's just little, little things that you don't understand. I don't like, I don't like shows where people have to stand. I don't like shows where I have to look at the audience and they look like they're fucking in a bad, they're just having a bad experience. Yeah. I don't like putting audiences. Well, because it's not really like. Oh, well, you can make ten more thousand dollars. I don't yeah. care. Yeah. I'd rather not make the money than piss them off and have them come back a second time. Yeah. Then go, I went there and I had a bad experience. I know what clubs I go to, that it's a bad experience when I'm there. I can feel it. Yeah. Those clubs I'll never go back to. Like, I just won't go back to them. Yeah, because it's, it's counterproductive what you're trying to do. What you're, you're trying, trying to, to do. You're trying to put everybody in a good mood. You're trying to make them laugh. You, I mean, the whole purpose of your thing is to make them laugh and put them in a great mood. And it's really tough to do that if they're jammed in. There's no room to move. They're Like you said, they're being you know being charged double or triple what they pay for a normal show. And then they throw out. I mean, some clubs do it right. Don't get me wrong. There's some clubs that do it right. They cater the food in. It's top shelf. It's, you know, uh, and and... They want everybody to have a good experience because I think a lot of clubs think that that's cool. Like you're stepping over a dollar to pick up a penny, a penny yes, to, to pick for for one fucking night, and those people will never come back to you. Never come back again never because come back they had again. a bad experience. So, like you said, it's kind of productive. But you're right; some people do it. They like to gouge. So it's like price gouging during a natural disaster. Like people raise their gas like three dollars. And it's like, fuck, what, you know, it's like, why would you do that to people? They're already down. Why are you kicking them? You know, make sure you have a good customer experience. Plus, people that come to your clubs now, they have a great customer service. They'll come back again and again. You're building a brand. Every time I come here, I see great comedians. Sometimes I look them up. Sometimes I don't. But every time I come to this club, I have a great experience. And and that's kind of what you're up against now. I mean, it's, you know, you got to, it's like, you know, comedy clubs are doing well. Comedy seems to be on a rise. And then someone goes and there's a bad experience at a club. That's when I go to a club and I feel about experience i don't go to that club again i don't yeah say it publicly or nothing like that i just in my mind go if i had a bad experience they had a bad experience and like i said you can't make a good you know well you can't make a good deal with a bad person i mean if they don't give a shit about the audience members or having a unique experience <coughs> then 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 fine but i mean like you said it's I, weird but what and I, I stand there and shake every hand on the way out and i thank people for coming to see my show and uh, you know larry the cable guy used to do that that is essential that's just, they want to meet you they what they had a great experience you shake their hand and you come back next time and follow me on social media and come back i mean you want to i mean that's what it's all about now you you, you know these these people that become fans of you, you want to nurture them and tell them to come out and see future shows. I mean, I don't know, but you're right that the clubs do that and it's, it's kind of, kind of creepy, but it's, it's weird how, what I learned as an open micer. When I went back to Denver in 93, I learned something about business that was really weird. You know, I had a couple guys that all they did all day as comics was, was hustle rooms. Right. God bless these guys. Yeah. God, God bless these guys. To always be in my heart because in those days the major clubs wouldn't give you stage time. Yeah, you know they had an open mic once a month on a Sunday and there was twelve people in there. But where you got better were these bar shows where yeah. there's a Laker game on or a, a Bronco game on or a Nugget game and you got to go in there and do comedy. That's where you learn how to become a comic. And then every three weeks you 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 go to an A room. Yeah, and you figure out how to put your bar set into an A set now. Yeah, because your bar sits a little dirty. It's a little bit more rugged. But what I remember is from all those sessions where I could always tell the guys that were fans of comedy and always tell, I'm talking about the bar owners. Yeah. I could always tell the bar owners that were in it for business, like a karaoke. Right. I didn't want to do business with them. Right. I wanted people that would say to me, hey, you know, can you get Jimmy Schubert in here? Wow. You know who Jimmy Schubert is. Yeah, my favorite's Bill Hicks. Like, those are the comedy club owners that you want to do comedy with. Yeah, because they care about the art form. And then 
two weeks going, and they'll go, come here for a second. Can you get me fluffy? And now you got to bring them down to earth and go, fluffy's, <laughs> fluffy's 20 Gs. Yeah. Oh, okay. Can, yeah, but is there another fat Mexican out there that we could say? You know, they are a fan of comedy. Yeah. Even, I always, if, even I, if they're losing money, yeah, they continue the show. And I always love working for guys like that. Yes, and I you always love working you guy, know guy, guys in open comedy clubs that are still like that. You love working for guys like that, you know, because they they understand that, you know, the art form. They're fans of it. How could you get mad at a guy who uh, you know creates an environment for you to make a living doing something you love to do? That's a fan of the comedy and the art form. It's I love working for those guys. That's like you well, know, one of those. There's a lot of guys you work for that number one they have. When you get to that club, they show up on Thursday. Listen, if you think after 20 years I'm going to watch a comic five nights in a row, if I'm the club owner, you got rocks in your head. (laughs) Okay? I don't even want to see a fucking comic again. I've been here for 16 years working every fucking night banging it out with comics. I got a kid in high school. You know, this is the essential comedy club owner who you talk to now. When I go to a club... You know, like you get a, a survey from the airlines now. Were well, you satisfied? When I go to a club, the first thing I look for is Thursday night. Right. I want the owner to show up. Right. If I fucking worked on Twitter and social network and gave the podcast to sell this place out, yeah, I expect that you see you there, shake my hand. I don't give a fuck if you show up the rest of the weekend. I'd rather not have you around with your right. tight ass because I'm going to be sparking in here. You know, I'm going to be doing what I do. I don't want you around, but I like those guys. I like those guys that call you Friday and go, if you need something, call the club manager and he'll drive you to whatever. Yeah, yeah. I don't need anything. I, I'll Uber. Yeah. But I like those guys. That goes into the package. For me, it's not the money. I'd rather make less money and get treated like a human being and for them to understand. You know, when I go into a comedy club and have to stab says to me, I heard the podcast with Jimmy Schubert, it, that, that means the world to me. Yeah. You know, me and Lee used to do a podcast at a club where every week the lady would call me. She didn't know what a podcast was. And I, and I said to Lee, we're never coming down here again because she, I can't deal with somebody who in the height of podcast doesn't know what a podcast is and managing a comedy club. Yeah, I'd rather not make that money. I'd rather avoid that whole fucking situation because if you're a fan of comedy and you're a comedy club manager, how don't you know about the podcast world? Yeah, dude, it is the single thing that has made comedy clubs come back again is the podcasting. You would go to a comedy store, you got three shows that are sold out. It's because of the podcasting. These people talk about that place. It's, I mean, it's why it's sold out every night. I mean, how are you, like you said, how could you go to be business and not know what a fucking podcast I can't, is? I can't. I mean, what the fuck? It's like somebody going, somebody's looking at the, you know, your, your, your comedy special, you're trying to sell it. He goes, yeah, I watched a couple minutes of it. Said, Did you not? Watch the whole fucking thing and just a couple of you watch five minutes of it. Is that enough? But it's like, it's weird. It's, it's the same thing. It's like, you know, take a minute. Think, I mean, you know, how busy are people? Well, here's the thing. The comedy podcast brought comedy back because people got to meet who we are now. Yeah. People get to see the real you. You know, uh, for years I thought, you know, for years I thought, like I said, I was a fan of that guy's. I saw him do HBO specials, and I saw him do Young Comedian specials, and then I worked with him, and I never fucking paid attention to him again. And now people avoid all that. You know what's in my heart. You know what's in my head. You yeah. know what my opinions are on certain fucking things. Yeah. You know, they know. People don't come to a show. Very rarely anymore do I see somebody get up in the middle of my set and walk out. Ten years ago, people would walk out by the dozens. Really? Yeah. Oh well, no! Now you found you found your fan when base. When I did you the longest yard, yeah. people would walk out by the handfuls. <laughs> by the handfuls. I well, now remember. they know what they're getting. They know what they're seeing. They know I, who they're coming I, to I, see. You I know. I still remember one particular weekend <laughs> in Atlanta before Laughing Skull. He had a big club. Do you remember before yeah. Laughing Skull? Yeah, it was, a, it was in a, it was like an amusement an thing. Amusement you, thing. And the guy rat was able to pay the comedians with the coins he made off all the amusement yes, games. Yes, Because that place was packed with the comedy club, and it was like he didn't care if the audience was He just, I don't remember. It, it was, was fucking crazy. Yeah. I remember going in there right after the longest yard on the way in. <laughs> fucking people were touching me. taking Like in those days, people didn't really bother you for pictures, but yeah. people were like doing different shit. Like, we can't wait to see it. And I still remember getting off that stage 
and those same people looking away. Yeah. Like I still remember going to all those rooms and just walking people by the handful. Yeah. Well, you know, I did. I tell you the truth, uh, you know, uh, Kennison used to do the same thing. I would remember I was a doorman at the comedy store before he got his fucking, before he was, you know, he would fucking, <laughs> we would walk. People out of the main room. He goes, I want you to take the names of three people who died that were close to you. Just write down the names of the three singers and then put it on a napkin and, and just, just hand them up here so I can wipe my ass with it. And people would make a fucking beeline for the door like they never like. But you know, but that's what happens until you find your fucking groove. You know what I mean? I mean, people like, you know, now that people are coming to see you, want to come see you. They know what you're doing. You know what I mean? But it's, it's so funny. Like, people go, like, how people come to a comedy club and don't, like, Google somebody and see what they do and they get upset in the showroom going, I didn't know. Didn't you fucking Google? No, but three, I seen three famous walks. Yeah. The best walk I ever seen was one of the best walking in a room was James Inman out of Seattle, Washington. <laughs> Yeah, you know James Inman. He's been around yeah. for a long yeah, time. Yeah, I've heard that name. Crazy, crazy motherfucker. Would walk a whole room. He would walk half of it. <laughs> Him and Kathy Sorbo, <laughs> a blonde little cute thing from Seattle, and they just walk around. I remember them walking Bremerton one night, like walking dirty people. Wow. And then, but the walk, the best walk out ever was Stanhope, ninety eight, Seattle, Washington. They were walking out in packs of threes, and he would yell at them and go, oh, hold on, before you leave, I want you to hear this tit fight joke. Or he would say something to me, why are you leaving? Come on, you know you're going to go home and fuck her up the ass and put your dick in the face. I mean, he was insulting them as they were leaving. Yeah. That was fucking classic. Like, they were walking out in threes. Yeah, and just, I, I love that, though. Just, but just the not giving a not fuck. Not to give a fuck. Of, of, of That's a, a complete different gift. No, that is. I mean, dude, I watched fucking Bill Burr. I was at the show in Philly when Bill Burr got fucking booed. I was getting booed by like 10,000 people and just fucking going at him. Like, fucking just, like, the sheer information he had about the city of Philadelphia and their sports teams and their losses and just fucking just jamming it down their throat. It was fucking brilliant. Like, just be, people were, half the people were loving it, half the people, oh, but it was fucking great. I'll never forget. I was watching, I was looking at Dom, and Dom goes, he's got 11 minutes left. And just after that, Bill Burr, I got 11 minutes left, and I'm doing all of it. And I was just fucking dying. Go, what balls that fucking, but it's, it's fucking great dude I, I love that <laughs> what are the options you can't yeah. walk off the stage because you lose yeah it's a psychological loss you just lost it's you and a microphone against 300 people yeah dude i was the first guy oh. out there they started fucking booing me about fuck I, i'm sitting there taking fucking haymakers how long were you to, taking haymakers uh, just for a couple minutes till i fucking realized i go these motherfuckers are booing i didn't realize they were fucking booing at first and then they're fucking booing and it's ten thousand people and your fucking family in the audience mm -hmm. and i know those fans if i go fucking off on these motherfuckers i was only supposed to do like eight minutes anyway and so i said hey thank you, you guys have been great but the minute i fucking next thing you know they're throwing fucking bottles at my head that's philadelphia bro they threw batteries at fucking you know they throw batteries at people they boo santa claus listen, they're horrible fucking listen, people listen i just want to i just listen. said thank you you've been great listen we got the fuck out of there i love philadelphia yeah i do too i mean with my heart i belong in philadelphia the that's way a great i belong city. in Law, mexico yeah <laughs> My thinking is a Philadelphia. I think of when I think of Philadelphia, I think of getting off the plane and seeing Joe Frazier's gym and my dick getting hard. Yeah. And that mentality. That Joe Frazier mentality. That's the mentality of the city. Yeah. I remember their football teams. I remember going there to see the Stones. Yeah. I remember going there to see Black Sabbath the Dio. You know, I spent a lot of time at Glassboro College. I spent a lot of time at that, those stupid cheese shop places, which I have no fucking idea what, what the names were then or whatever. Oh, Patch and Gino's, the cheese steak. Yeah, this is, 80, this is 80, 81, yeah. 82, 83. I was in Philadelphia 10 times a fucking year. Then when Dr. J went to Philly, uh, forget about it. Yeah, I learned Philadelphia. I would go to those games at the Spectrum yeah. and save the coupons because if they scored over 125 points, you got a free hamburger at the corner joint and then there'd be a thousand fucking mulanyans and Chinese people you gotta wait up to get a free cheeseburger you know what happens when you give away a free cheeseburger in Philadelphia <laughs> you know what that's like that's like bat 
bat day at Yankee Stadium yeah. when the Red Sox are coming. <laughs> You're just inciting a war. You know what I'm saying? You're just inciting a fucking war. But what is well known about Philadelphia that I don't have to tell a guy like you is in the 70s, they already had a jail at RFK State or JFK yeah. Stadium. As a courtroom in a jail. A courtroom in a jail. This is this is just to let you know, people. In the 70s, if you look at all the biggest world tours of rock musicians, the first night was always Philadelphia. Why? To get it out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> to get it out of the way. <laughs> We're going to get tortured. I know. Let me tell you how back I go with Philadelphia, just to tell you motherfuckers. I go back to Philly, July 81. Look it up and Google me back or whatever if I'm right or I'm wrong the date here. It had to be July of 81, 80. Black Sabbath with Ronnie James Dio, Sammy Hagar before Van Halen, <coughs> and somebody else. Philadelphia. I had never seen this before. My fucking whole life at the age of 17, 18. They were spitting on their fingers. They would clam on their fingers and flick the finger to spit at you. I was in sixth row at Black Sabbath. And the first five rows were just people. Spitting on their fingers and flinging it at, at Sammy Hagar. Sammy Hagar's on stage fucking evading spit. <laughs> okay, so I put all these things together in my head that you can't sing in Philly. The football. Didn't they hit somebody with a battery at a football game? Yeah, they threw. There was a, one of the Dallas Cowboys. They thought he hurt his neck. I think it was maybe Drew Pearson at number 88. They don't give kid. a fuck. And he fucking, it was a, like a fucker. And they started throwing fucking batteries at the guys. They're carting them off. Like, they booed fucking Santa Claus. Now, granted, that was like December 15th. Santa Claus is only Santa Claus one day a year. That's December 25th. So that guy was just a fat guy in a red suit rooting for the wrong team. They fucking booed him out of. But I mean, they're notoriously fucking horrible. Why else would you put a jail? Like, they're consistently number two worst fans in every sport. But nobody, it's a great, it's with Dice Tape this special. Yeah. Which, if you want, If they love you, bro, they love you. If they love you, they love they, you. They and love that's you. why I love going there every year. Yeah. I go there every year. Yeah. Was, it, was it the Heaven and Hell tour? Yeah. August 9th of 1980. Yeah. August 9th. They, they, they spit at him. When Ronnie James oh, Dio took yeah. the stage, they were booing him. Yeah, they, they were throwing they, they things horrible at him, things, drinks. They, yeah, they fucking and security can, can't even control you. We did it. That's where the my buddy. In fact, we got to the show with like shitty tickets. <laughs> that was like a whole fucking day. We got to the show with shitty tickets. My buddy left and came back with better tickets. He finagled 18th row for six row center, and then he came back with these quaaludes that weren't really quaaludes. They were. These long purple things. I go, dog. What's wrong with you? You know, it was acid. He yeah. came back with these thick acid. I go, it looked like a little marshmallow that somebody spray painted purple. Yeah. I go, that's not acid. He kept saying, I'm telling you, it's acid. He they ate two of them, and during the show, he passed out. <laughs> so on the drive home, we kept telling him those are purple quaaludes, and he was pissed. I'm telling you, those weren't quaaludes. That's a They were acid. Then why the fuck did you pass out? Yeah, dude. So for years, every time he'd come to me and go, Schubert's got the best Coke or something, he'd go, oh, you know, he's got good Coke, Lee. I go, weren't you the guy that did the purple quaaludes in Philadelphia? <laughs> he never lived. Fuck you. It was, I'm telling you, that was the best acid I ever did. <laughs> <laughs> did I remember that? So we were going to go downtown and he's just, They'd shave pencil shavings and they'd sell the dudes for like, you know, and it's real good weed, man. It's like Mexican rum, but it was pencil shavings. And these fucking stupid kids would buy it because they never know what fucking pot looked like. And I go, you ripped it, you got ripped off again, you idiot. Talk, I remember being in Philly and snorting coke. We had the trunk open for that Black Sabbath tour. Right. The trunk, in those days, you put coolers in your trunk. Yeah. And you went to a concert and you tailgated. Right. The same way. You tail we had the trunk open. Yeah. We had the two coolers out. Getting your pre show buzz on. We had the car stereo on, heaven and hell. Right. We're hanging out. We had a little bottle. We were the plan was to go to Philadelphia and then drive to Seaside Heights and spend the night on the way back. Right. That was the plan. So I'd have one of those little brown bottles filled with Coke to the fucking brim. And the next thing you know, fucking uh a car pulls up and it's the FBI. They throw us up against the car, and they go through our shit. And that bottle was in there, dog. It was in plain sight. They were looking for bootleg T-shirts. Because uh. people were selling bootleg T-shirts back there, and that's yeah. what they were looking for. The FBI or some shit. 
fucking boot. They didn't mess. They missed the brown, little brown they bottle. They didn't touch that little fucking bindle of death. It was one. It was the days <laughs> when they had the little bottle with the spoon at the top. Oh yeah, yeah, I remember. Yeah, you, you know, get it all. One, one man, one, one, man one, one man, bro. It was a guy with the bass drum and the cymbal on things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, it was a one man band. <laughs> then they sold the kits. Remember they sold? Then they started opening up the kits. Yeah, and the kit was like a, a wallet. Lee, it came like a wallet. Yeah, it was you like that little. It, it had that little, uh, the little like, green. It was like an off color green off thing. Off color green. When you flip it up, a little and it was slate, a, sca- a, a scale. little slate. <laughs> then there was a green thing, right? And there was a scale that was tiny, yeah. that was accurate as fuck. Yeah, bro. Those things were little scale. I come to you. What, 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 what was it? Did it say uh, gram? Two no, it had three a, grams. It, it the way had, they it bought. Had, it had a fucking and a little alligator clip on the end of it. You put on the thing and you'd hold it off your thumb and it would weigh down like it was just so. Uh, that was the weed one. Yeah, yeah, that was the weed one. That was the weed one there was a weed one that you put on your thumb and it hung down and it hung down and it would be perfect and you put the bud in it and it would weigh Jesus. perfect yeah and then they came up with the green one the one that was compact that you put in your pocket and you took it out and you could weigh coke in it and put it at whatever yeah. it was good for eight balls grand yeah, they, they had a digital readout one too, and it was also pretty good no i never got to the digital no. reader that was one. and then we robbed the high school and we robbed the science lab and we took all the triple beam scales that was like a big shot <laughs> A teacher had to come to my house. Listen, you got to give a couple of them back. Like, they cut a deal with us. So you, you keep 30, but you got to give us 30 back. You can't leave us without triple beans. We were walking out of there every day without, without, with a triple bean scale. Oh, that's hilarious. One day I go, why am I walking out? We went to the high school. We took all the triple beam scales. Two days later, Camel Breath, George McGrath, one of the fucking crazy teachers. Like, listen, they know. Just give us half the scales back. <laughs> I had to show up. With the fuck. <coughs> Everybody had those triple beam scales. The fucking town. No. Everybody had a scale at the house. Lee, how crazy is that? In the eighties, if you didn't have a scale, you were like an outcast. Like if I went to your house, <laughs> let me get a scale. Okay, it's in the back room. Dude, there's this uh, this famous story. that was like I was with. Uh, it was like one time we were at the back in Crest Hill days. And there's this guy named Magic, this Middle Eastern dude that used to be like you know it was the guy would be able to get Sam's stuff. You know, he's like, he's kind of like a dealer. His name is man. But I watched this guy one time. He had to go Now, what year is this? This is like, shit, 89. Now, he was Arab? Was, yeah, he was like now, an Arab. remember, that's when there wasn't a lot of Arabs around. No, no. So if one Arab showed up, he had to be really cool. He had to show up with diamonds and yeah, coke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but he and was, you he always was one knew of those guys. He was Sam the Arab. And did he and watch I had this Joe guy? the Arab yeah. in New York. I, I was it, telling you. So basically. It was cool to be Arab in the 80s. So this dude. <laughs> This dude has a bag, but he takes his two fingers, digs them into the bag. He, like, tore a page out of it. The first time I've ever seen this done, I go, this has got to be a scene in a movie. He tears a page out of the magazine, like, almost straight, folds it like the perfect triangle, makes a bindle out of it. Then he looks in the freaking bag, and he fucking eyeballs. He takes his two fingers in. He grabs a bit. He freaking looks out of the eye. He throws it in the freaking bindle. You know, but a little more. Like, I, he just eyed an eight ball. Then, like, there was stuff on the end of his fingers. He just, like... And he just folded it up, and he goes, "Here, take, like take that, and take that to, over to Central." It was like he eyed an eight ball. I never seen anybody do that before in the front seat of a car. Like go from like you know right out of the bag into the bindle into the thing. If I knew what was in the bag, I could eye an eight ball. Yeah, and it could be off two point five maybe. Yeah, if I, I knew I had, if I knew I had seven in the in the bag, I could eye an eight ball. Yeah. If I knew I had fourteen, I could eye an eight ball. You know, I could, I could eye. It you could pretty much, much eye, it. yeah. I could eye it, take some out. Throw it I was just a young kid. I was like, you know, I probably like maybe twenty six or twenty seven. And I saw that guy do that. And you go, damn man, that's amazing. How long have you been doing comedy for now? Jesus, bro, I started and I started in Philly. It was like coming up on thirty, thirty years. Did yeah, but you, I, did no, you know Dom back in Philly or was Dom no? I didn't know Dom out? back in Philly. There's a couple I knew Keith Robinson back in Philly and knew Todd Glass back in Philly and knew like you know those were the kind of guys that we kind of started with uh, you know some and uh, yeah. But I only I did comedy for about like two years in Philly. I was going to go to New York and I said, well, if I go to New York, eventually I'm going to have to go to L.A. anyway. And I go, I got this, you know, and I and I because I've been you know been performing like you know basically like my whole life. I was always doing fucking magic when I was eleven and twelve. I got like three or four shows. Don't bring it up. No, bring it up. So I won't. So then and then I went to uh, and I hit eighteen. I just went to clubs for a couple of years and headed out this way. And because I, I knew I was going to if I went to New York, I was going to have to go to L.A. anyway. So I just said, let me just skip out the middleman and just go to L.A. And then I started working at the I, I showcase for Mitzi like two weeks later. I didn't pass, but I got a job at the doorman the night they hand the night that uh, Tony Clifton 
was supposed to appear in the main room. It was like a year after Andy Kaufman's death. And I mean, Tony Clifton is appearing at the, the main room in the comedy store. And everybody thought, oh, fuck, Andy, it was a character that Andy Kaufman used to do. This Tony Clifton guy. They thought Andy Kaufman was a year after his death. They thought it was going to be. And that was the day I started working as a doorman. They needed extra people because it was crazy. And it was really Bob Zamuda dressed as, as, as Tony Clifton because so. But all the media thought it was Andy Kaufman playing a joke on him. And he went up there and just fucking. I never seen any like it. The guy was on stage like probably 15, 20. We'll start walking people. He's flitting like cigarettes at people, throwing drinks at people. This character, Tony Clifton, was a fucking nutbag. Empties the fucking room out. And then people were walking out like, well, we felt like, you know, it was just hilarious. But ever since then, I started working at the door. And then eventually I got passed as a, as a like non-paid regular. I could do the belly room. So probably like, you know, 86, 87, you know, is where I started. Jesus Christ. Yeah. That was big when Bob Zamuda. I never got all that. By the way, no, I never did either. Just I mean, it was because Andy Kaufman used to do this character, and then and when he would do it, like about halfway through doing the character, Andy Kaufman would do it. He gave the character to Bob Zamuda and said, "You do Andy Kauf. You do and or he said, "You do uh, Tony Clifton from now on." You just here's the thing because they were dressed up. It was a big deal, and all, everybody knew that Andy Kaufman was doing that character. They didn't realize he had handed it off for him to do. So a year after his death. When Tony Clifton's making an appearance at the main room at the comedy store, everybody thought this is where Andy's going to fuck. This is where Andy's going to tell everybody he didn't really die. They thought he was like playing a joke on him. So, but it was fucking crazy and it was insane. And that's what, like you know, that's the night I met Bob Zamuda, who to this day continues to do the Tony Clifton character, which is where. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he does it around town. He does. I've seen him at Flappers. I've seen him. i seen him do it in uh, in Chicago at the at one of the Chicago comedy festivals. I mean, he's just. I mean, that's not like a big thing because most people don't remember Andy Kaufman used to do the character. It's way beyond. Like, like you should have dropped that like years ago. But he still does it. I mean, it's it's the stupidest thing. Like, you know, it's just like at one point it was good. He would actually try to do a show, but he's been in the comedy store in the main room. He does Tony Clifton. He has the singing girls. Not recently, but you know, probably like maybe two two years ago, three years ago, he was doing it. I mean, you know, people, you know, people get the backstory and they think it's kind of fun, but. Most people don't even know who fucking Sam Kinison was, let alone who, and, and even though Andy Kaufman looked a big enough body work, most people don't, you know, the younger generation, they don't have any fucking reference. They don't, like, know, you know, you got to turn people on to Sam Kinison. They go back and look at his YouTube stuff and go, wow, that guy was fucking great. They don't know him now. He's been dead for 26 the years. The other night, I got the Sam Kinison foxhole. Oh, yeah. I went to look up something on Young Comedian Special. Oh, yeah. And I watched Sam set, and then there was something from... I watched something else, like a longer one, live yeah. from hell or something. Yeah. And I was fucking howling. Dude. You know, let me tell you what happened. About an hour later, I turned off the thing. When I think I got like a soda or something. It must have been 11.30 at night. Right. And I went back on social media and I checked my Twitter. And the first tweet that came up was, hey, how fucked up was Kennison at that taping in Vegas? And I fucking go, how creepy is this shit? Some guy out of random on Twitter. Wow. New Year's Eve said this to me. I went wow. down to Foxhole New Year's Eve. Yeah. I was in the mood for kids. Dude. New Year's Eve. You don't even know how crazy that was. I mean, he had scheduled three fucking shows. Dude, he was like, when we did, like, we did the Universal Amphitheater in freaking that show and he had like ginger baker on the drums he had cc deville from poison it's fucking david lee roth was there i mean it was like a fucking new year's and then we all go to the van nuys airport jump on fucking lear jets fly to vegas for like a 3 a.m show i mean that was one of the years he did it but kinnison also did like he was fuck, a 3 a.m show to a 3 a.m show in vegas bro and but that but that's the one where sam was so fucked up his brother bill's doing a countdown from behind the curtain damn because his brother the bill because like Sam was so fucked up they didn't even want to do the show but they you know they got him on fucking oxygen they got him breathing I mean, this is after like three this is after like staying up for like three four days in a fucking row and like you say your fucking room service bill is seventy five hundred dollars for three days just in booze and shit I mean dude he did I mean believe me bro that was like I mean that was it bro I, I did that that one trip in Vegas I came back and I started going to fucking AA meetings I said I'm done I'm fucking done bro I mean I did I had to get a cat scan I thought I had brain damage Would that I mean, go today comedy no Would that behavior no, fly fuck today no it doesn't it can't go I, i'm you know i'm glad it happened when it did bro because it, i mean you, joe you know how fucking look how hard you fucking work you can't do that shit you lose fucking three or four days i, I mean it's not i told lee that if 
I was still doing coke, Lee would have been here waiting for me 10 times. Yeah, I mean, it's not even that. I would have been calling you going, Lee, I'll be there in 10 minutes. Yeah, it's just, 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 just plus off, dude. We're just, that 6 a.m. podcast we used to do? Yeah. There's dude, no way it would have lasted, it's, it's, it it's, lasted it's, 90 it's, days. It's insane, dude. I think about it sometimes. I get, I get physically ill when I think about the amount of drugs. It's just the fucking people hanging out, the fucking, all these fucking, like, it was just kind of like like creepy. You know, I mean, uh, fucking Kinnison was my buddy, man. I got put fucking great moments in my life. I get to do the Spectrum in Philadelphia. I open for him in front of 6,300 people. I mean, this guy was fucking, uh, you know, I had a... I just felt fucking bad for the dude, man. You say, you say, you know, like you go. The comedians today are prepared for success. It's like nobody wants to be that guy. It wouldn't fucking play. I mean, look at look at, you know, and God rest their souls. But the, you know, Chris Farley's and the and, and the guys that you, the John Belushi's and Kinnison's, it's like these the Mitch Hedberg's. What's that? The Mitch Hedberg's. Yeah, I mean, guys that you fucking were. I mean, it just you, you kills know, the. It's not. It's not enough to be fucking a great fucking comedian. You really have to be prepared for success when it comes. And just some of us are, you know, to, it's just taking some of us, you know, a little longer than others. I mean, I was. I learned how to learn how to become a professional. You have to learn how to do these things. And sometimes it's just, you know, I mean, I always think back on freaking kids like, what would he have done? And I do the exact opposite. It usually works out. My big, you know, <laughs> I'm gonna go. My home. big fear was not getting high. Because I wouldn't be funny. Like, for the last three years of my cocaine life, I was at struggle with myself. Yeah. Because I re it's like being that fat guy. You get yeah. a bunch of work, but your doctor tells you you need to lose weight. Yeah. And you lose 100 pounds and you start getting rolls. Yeah. You're not that fat guy no more. Yeah. Well, the same thing. I was really concerned about if I stop this cocaine thing, yeah. that the funny will not be there anymore. That's part of the whole craziness i thought that was really ingrained in what fueled me yeah so the fear that fear was what kept me from stopping from maybe 2004 on i wanted to quit cocaine well yeah but i'm like i can't do this well it's interesting i mean i think you know you're such an authentic human being i mean some guys uh you know like like us i mean you, you sometimes you there's two versions you either fucking drink and and do the cocaine to fucking to fuel the fire or you fucking try to put the fire out with using drugs and cocaine and sometimes you know some guys i, I mean i don't know I, I, I feel the same way. I just, you know, I just had to come off it. I just didn't. I just didn't enjoy who I was on it anymore. And I and, and I think I wore out of gear because, you know, you do that stuff. I just, I, I just couldn't do it now. I just think, I just all I just think of is like all the fucking time. What waste. do you do after a show? What is your ritual after Thursday night, Friday night, and Saturday night show? Well, usually I gotta get up at six o'clock in the morning. So I do sit there. I literally, I, I really try to have a really great show on Thursday night. I get, I, you know, and and you get up at six and go do media. So I go right home. I, you know, I drink a bunch of water and uh, get up and do my media and, and just plan and know like what I did on, on those shows before. So try to do some new bits. How about though. Friday night when you get back Friday from the night? Hotel. Uh, Friday night, I, I just relax. I just you know, I, I, I do you I, smoke reefer? Do you do a Xanax? Or do you do a pot cookie? Yeah, I do. A, I, I would do a pot cookie that would because it kind of helps me sleep. That's why I really do it. I, I mean, I I would do a. And then, and then just get ready for the set. For for me, it's all about working on the on the material. Now, the high for me is go, doing great. You know, come up with some new bits, and that gets me excited more than anything. Is come up with a new bit that kills. I mean, I got a, a new twenty minutes in the front of my act that I just I just kind of got working. I mean, the first bit you come out gets a round of applause, and the second bit, and the third, and I, I'm excited about that. I can't I wait mean, for the how set. do you feel about that today? Like, <clears throat> we had this fucking stupid excuse. It was a fucking excuse that, oh, you know, well, when a comic or performer gets off stage, yeah. their adrenaline, they, they have to keep the high going. It was this fucking bullshit that I bought into also. I'm not going to lie to you. Yeah. But I'm going to debunk that bullshit right now. Yeah. First off, yes, you need, that need something to take that edge off. When I come off stage and I have a great set, I'm ready to fight somebody. Yeah. Like I want to stab somebody in the fucking lung. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then you talk to your peers behind stage a little bit, and then you go yeah. out and take pictures or whatever, and then you go back to your room, and your mind starts racing. You know, for me, my mind starts racing. That's why I bring the vapor with me. Yeah. I roll the extra joint when I get back to the hotel. Yeah. You know, because that's my night to be loose. Yeah. I love my Friday night in comedy. Yeah. My Friday night in comedy, I don't have to get up. Yeah, the next night, right? Saturday. Yeah, you know. I don't have to do shit. 
Yeah. All I know is I got to beat that hotel breakfast by 11. That's right. <laughs> okay. If I can make it down there by 11, you get that that's breakfast. all I need. Because yeah. even if I go to bed at 4, I'll be walking around at 9. Yeah. I get up at 9, I drink a cup of coffee in my room. Yeah. I hit the vapor pen to get the appetite going. And then I you roll a joint. Yeah. yeah. I roll a joint. Sometimes I wash my pussy. Sometimes I go down with a dirty pussy. <laughs> I just wash my hair and put some monkey juice on it. And uh, I look tim tap magoo. I put visine yeah. in my eyes. I eat that breakfast downstairs, the two eggs, the two slices of bacon, one piece of wheat toast, a <sighs> cup of oatmeal. I go around for a walk around the neighborhood. I blast that fucking number. And then I go back upstairs and I put on something on Narcos yeah. until I feel a little tired. I take that nap till 2 and I'm good. Yeah. So that whole debunk of the, well, we need to keep the party alive. No. After no. The fucking, no. That's just an excuse. No, to give it, no and it, fucking, it's bullshit. Actually, a junkie. I lived off it so I could tell yeah, you. When I go back into the green room, I take a couple of fucking deep breaths and I let it fucking go. I mean, that's the biggest thing I do is let go of that fucking energy from the show because it was a fucking show. Just kind of fucking calm down. Go out there, get a nice fucking big bottle of water or maybe I'll, maybe I'll have a drink, one drink. And then get the fuck out of there. Say hi, take pictures, and then get the fuck out. I mean, I'm not about keeping the party going. I got to do stuff. I think if I, like, you know, have those nights where you, like, fucking knock back, like, four or five drinks, you just, you lose the next two days. You know, you sleep in a little bit. I guess I can't, I can't afford to do it anymore, you know? Well, and, and like you said, it's not taking care of yourself. Well, the recovery take- time, the recovery time, listen. I couldn't handle hangovers when uh-huh. I was 35. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I was already puking blood. I would go to that fucking Miami Wet Willies, uh, and I'd drink those red drinks. Those, those, those the ca- call a cab? Call a cab. <laughs> and I'd be fucked up. Oh, uh, you know who I saw two Dave and Elliot, Dave and Elliot Merrill's. How are they no, doing? Oh, dude, the Merrill's boys are great. They, they You know, this. I was in West Palm, and I thought about them the whole time. Oh, uh, man, they, they, they they're, they're such good guys. Number. Dude, I was just down there hanging with them. We had uh, we had lunch. They're they're good. They were Paradise trying. Point Hotel. Pa- Paradise Point Hotel, bro. They're, those guys. Were the, they're, I mean, those two guys are great, man. They're, they're like they're they're from the old school, but they're they're twenty years, and they still haven't made that movie. And <laughs> and they've spent millions. They got millions. Those two cocksuckers. <laughs> they both walk around squeaking. Those Jew brothers. They fucking both of them. <laughs> one plays tennis all day. The other one quit smoking pot. Yeah. So now he don't smoke pot. No, no. He was a fucking big pothead. I mean, the moment you went to Paradise Point was a hotel in, oh, yeah, in South true. Beach. Yeah, but they still have it. They, they Airbnb, still have it. And they, you know, the Airbnb. They Airbnb. But they, but they you know, yeah. they're, they're real. They're very low key. But they, like you said, they live like doctors. In they the live office. like doctors in West Palm. I think the, the father had they invented the tennis racket. Yeah, he's got more money <laughs> than fucking uh, you know. And they were just these two sweet brothers. They were tremendous. I, I mean, yeah. Hey, you know, there was a time where, like, you know, they, they, you got hung out with those guys that took care of you. Oh, fed, my you God. Know. You went to, yeah. I would stay in Miami. They'd give me a room at the hotel for yeah. free. They, you could walk to a bodega where they were at. There's a movie called Empire, one of the worst movies you'll ever see. Yeah. It's got John Leguizamo and a couple other people in the movie. Madonna's husband's in it. Yeah. It's, a, it's an interesting movie if it's late night and you're by yourself and it's yeah. on HBO. But the scene where he goes to Miami to shoot the guy. And he meets a guy, and he tells him, the guy tells him to spit the gum out of his mouth, and he goes, why? He goes, put the gun under the piece of the table. The gun's waiting for you. It's like me calling you and going, going to Philly. Right. And the piece when I get there. Right. And all of a sudden, you go, meet me at this bodega. That right. bodega was walking distance from Paradise Point, uh-huh. and they sold Cuban food by the pound. Lee, you have no idea. I would get fucked up till 6, 7 in the morning get up at 10 and walk over to that fucking bodega, a bodega that had tremendous Cuban food. And they would get one of those fucking containers, like you get at Chow Ling's, what's that fucking Chinese restaurant? The, when you get the five different orders, yeah, they would put black beans on one, rice packet in it. And oh, yeah, I remember bag. that joint. It was fucking great. Oh, with a side order of fried bananas and two or three cans of Coca-Cola, and I'd walk back to that hotel. And I'd inhale that food, smoke a joint, and go right back to bed. Every room that has a different theme. Yeah. They're like the pirate's room. They got like the fucking. The, those one was the sea, where it was all the sea creatures. Right, and stuff. the sea was, creatures. But all the rooms had their own theme. But they had like eight rooms down yes. there. And dude, during And they these, had a rooftop patio. A rooftop patio. And during the season, all the models that were down there That's shooting right. would stay there. So they all these beautiful girls, these skinny, hot, sexy it's European crazy. models would come crazy. down there. And then every afternoon would be a roof in the party. And then At they'd the play roof, guitar. Yeah, they'd go up the roof party. And Montrez would sing his, you know, play his music. And he's met. 
Montrez is one of those black singers that would make white girls' pussies oh. go crazy. Yeah, you could bring out the panties. Oh, my God. Montrez was, was fucking brilliant. He yeah, was brilliant. he was. He's great. He's still you doing, know, yeah. He still lives in the basement, I think. Yeah. They still got him living in the office. Montrez is one of those guys that fell between the cracks. And it happens in comedy. Yeah. And it happens in music. And it happens all the time because just something didn't click. Like yeah. That. Well, it's uh, it's like anything else. I mean, you know, it's like yeah, you're right. It happens. You see all that stuff. You see it with music. You see it with bands. It's fucking you know, Tommy Conwell and the Young Ones has fuck, been. He could fucking sing, man. Oh yeah, he could sing. He still can sing. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I did a thing about my first ten years of comedy. I came on the podcast and wrote it out. I really yeah. thought about it because I just wanted people to know what you need to go through. You know, I went through the first three years where I would just tell people I was a comic and I'd get on stage once every two weeks and yeah. I would improvise and not have any material. And then I finally fell in love with it and I attacked it. And then, uh -huh. uh, and then I moved to LA and I felt bad afterward because I re looked it over and I didn't mention you one time. And this is why I'm having you on the podcast today to apologize to you because there's nobody who helped me out when I got here more than you. Oh, really? Like, yeah. Like, I remember talking to a certain comic up at the store one night, and I don't know how you and me connected, and you said, don't talk to him. He's a fucking loser. And then at that time, you had just gotten your, your first deal when you came back from Montreal, and yeah. the guy from NBC came up to you. Yeah. I mean, you hooked me up with your manager, who I just spoke to the other day. Jeff Kittler, who I love. Who I love dearly. Yeah. You taught me the ropes. You even gave me a briefcase to take my notes and notebooks on the road with me that I just recently threw away when I moved to the valley because it was such a beat up suitcase. Yeah, it was already broken. But it had so much tradition. <laughs> yeah. Like it had like you had put ten years into it. Oh, yeah. It was like a suitcase to have your headshots and resumes. Yeah, well, in just because you do want to take it notebooks. serious. Notebooks. Because you're coming out here, you know, uh, people don't get it. It's like it's really like, kind of like when you're out on the road and you're traveling, you're touring. It's like playing college ball. But when you get to L.A., and even though it's a fucking, it's really kind of running with the pros because you're gonna you're gonna have auditions and you're gonna have shit. And you go, this isn't a fucking game anymore, and you're competing some of the best people. In the, you just gotta have your fucking shit together a little bit. No, you schooled me, and yeah. I want to thank you. I want to take oh, the time, dude. It's my pleasure. I remember you were you were taking acting classes on Mondays at the Improv. With that dude who was like a high level acting coach. Yeah, he was. He worked with comedians specifically. <coughs> specifically, I, I, I want to say Crack Hour. Yes, Bob Crack Hour. Bob Crack You got me. I I, I couldn't and, afford. And that guy, class. you know, was in that acting class. Who? It was Jeff Jenna. It was Jimmy Fallon. It was me. It was Kathleen Madigan. It was like you know there were some. Uh, I, there were some fuck Todd Glass was. I mean some heavyweight, like fucking comics at the time. And he was specifically worked with comedians and trying to. Get, dude, I booked everything with that with fucking that guy. guy. Yeah. I love Bob Krakauer because I, he was he got what you did. He goes and I would work and like if I had an audition, I could work with him in class and then go do it later on. Amazing him and a woman named Karen West. I mean, you know, look, I got little parts here, I got bigger parts here, I got some, but you know, people don't realize that collectively you get that fucking money from Shaw and you get residuals and you get your insurance and you get the fucking bank and a credit union, and you get benefits from the fucking union that, that you didn't get with fucking stand up. And so I was always like, yeah, I gotta keep my fucking feet because it's just. Well, it's funny that, that I learned that from you. Yeah. When I, by the time our, cro our paths crossed, I had already realized that I was not gonna get any love as a stand up. The stand-up cards were not not at that time. Montreal didn't want me. The yeah. improvs didn't want me. I you know couldn't the find the manager. Yeah, dude. I couldn't find an agent. I mean, it just and you had books. You had book go. Yeah. You had just book go. And I just finished. what year did go come on? Ninety. It came out ninety nine. Ninety nine. No. This, I was I was hanging with you before that. Some, yeah, yeah, we were hanging. We, I was hanging but, with but, you before that. But I booked that fucking role. I mean, I just got back from the bar my my twelve year old cousin Joey Casey had passed away, and I wasn't in the fucking mood for the Hollywood bullshit. And I went in, and and I had a couple auditions that day, and they called me back for it, and I just fucking threw it, and I just fucking did my thing. And I really put all the threw the chair down, I kicked the fucking chair a couple of times. I was like, I was supposed to fucking freak out. I just fucking turned around, I just walked out of the fucking joint. And, uh, you know, Gitlin, our, 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 our amigo,
Vigo calls me and he goes, uh, you're in first position for that fucking movie. I went, big deal, because I was still in the middle of doing a fucking development deal thing. I was trying to get a fucking TV show on, so I didn't give a fuck about... That movie Go was a fucking brilliant fucking cult classic. I used to work with uh, Doug Lyman, the guy who directed that, but it was like... I mean, it, it came at a really fucking shitty point in my, my life, but I got the role, and I was like, that's when I started to realize. But yeah, I mean, you know, you you don't realize as a comedian, you can still get these things. If you can audition well, you can get them, you know? You, you And so... Yeah, right, because you got the deal first. I hung with you. I met you when you were in the process of the deal. Yeah, and trying you to find... You would go to Hoy's Walk. You yeah, would always Hoy's buy Walk. me lunch at Hoy's Walk. <laughs> yeah, that's right. On uh, Sunset in La Brea. We would smoke a joint. We'd go back to your house. And then you also discovered that I was the real deal when I called the the quarterback that Dude, night. Dude, we were. I was. I made That's my the chili. First time bro. ever. I made my fucking chili. I had the world class. Yeah, you were watching the game, and you were calling the plays. You were calling the plays. You go. Oh, this, 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 this John Elway is going to run this thing in Monday himself. night watch football. This, this I know balls. how it works. Oh my god, bro! He you called it, pants. dude. He, I, he was calling him, and and, and, and they get, that was the play where he jumps in, he gets hit in the back, and spins and around, spins around, and landed in. I go watch. I always going to run this in. Yeah, I was calling the play because I knew Denver so well. It was like he was I in the huddle. I was bro. watching Denver for years. I was there when Elway got drafted. I was there yeah. when against Cleveland when he made the, the drive against Cleveland. Yeah. I knew Elway like the back of my hand. Yeah. I knew that he had to get the right team. Dude, I knew I knew, I, dude, I knew football and you were like three I'm going, this motherfucker. Oh, I knew was, I like, knew you that legitimate. I man. knew them. By this time yeah. I was watching. Because you so used much. to call, you used to collect book over there when you were watching yeah. for the booth with them. So I would watch <laughs> I would watch the Broncos to the end. I yeah. knew Elway's. You know, I still remember when they won their first championship. I cried because yeah. I always knew Elway was a winner. When I heard that story about how the Yankees, when fucking the guy went into the, the meeting, yeah, and Steinbrenner opened up the cabinet and left field was Elway. Yeah, he goes, I don't care about fucking football. That's my team. In two years, I want John Elway because Elway could. They had, yeah, he was a, a baseball player and he a was football a ba baseball player. So. If nobody really knows the story, it's very interesting. Did he get signed to San Diego? It was a scam. Oh. They scammed everybody. They scammed everybody. First of all, it was the biggest football draft ever for quarterbacks. It was Elway, Marino, uh, Boomer, Siason. It was like a big fucking draft. And fucking, you got to watch the 30 for 30 because I'm not giving it any justice. Right. Elway got drafted by the Baltimore Colts. That's what it was. And he didn't want to play for Baltimore. He's like, I'm not going to Baltimore. So Steinbrenner cut a deal with him. Steinbrenner goes, listen, I'll give you half a mil. Give me a quarter of a mil back. You say you play baseball. I send you up to fuck up there for a couple months. Just play baseball for a few months. We'll forget about this whole thing, and then I'll sell you to Denver. It was like a kinky deal. But Elway, the rumor was that Elway could step Elway could step on the warning track with his left foot and without moving, put it in the catcher's mitt. That was, that was the room. That Elway could get a ball and just fucking launch it and put it right in the catcher's mitt. That was how good Elway was, but he couldn't hit. He was phenomenal. His arm was great. He could field. Something he really, just couldn't hit. I don't know the exact story, so that's what they did. It was a scam. Steinbrenner, the king Jew that he was, because Steinbrenner did not take shit from anybody. He got involved. <clears throat> and he got fucking, what's his name? Got him on there. Yeah, yeah go, go take yourself one. He got him on the fucking team. They did something, and then the Broncos picked him up, and that's how the Broncos ended up with John Elway. And John Elway got tortured from day one in Denver. They didn't like him because they were a football town. Yeah. And then he started winning, but then he lost four Super Bowls or something. Like two Super Bowls or three in a row. They got killed against the Redskins. The only yeah. black quarterback to ever go bananas. Yeah. Once against him. Fucking Pete, those racists in Denver were going crazy. Oh, yeah. Doug, Doug, Doug. Oh, that's a play from Washington. Yeah. Ah, oh, jeez. I, I know who you're talking about. Guy, yeah. He never played football again. Well, yeah, he never got the, the credit. The KKK there. showed up at his yeah, house. Well, so whatever listen, the deal is. But I mean, he, you know, Elway did one both. Doug Williams. Two years. Two, Doug Williams was his name. He yeah, played for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and they went bananas on the Broncos. That guy never played again. They went to his house the next day and said, you ever play football again? You embarrass white people. <laughs> you destroyed wow. white people. We will never fucking let you play football again. He's He's coaching fucking high school football in the witness relocation league. Yeah. You think I'm fucking kidding? Well, you know what I love? I love that Elway, towards the end of his career, wins 
back to back Super Bowls. Although he was a bad mother, but that's what I'm saying. Like, don't he, ever he got, get that. Wrong. No, no. But also love that he also got with Peyton Manning and got him to go out where he got surrounded him with enough good players that he got a second ring on his way out. And I mean, he wasn't uh, Peyton Manning of of, of uh, years before, but always do had to manage the game because that defense was ridiculous. But I love that he got the second Super Bowl ring playing with. Uh, you know, Doug Elway is the you know running the front office of that team. The Denver Sorry Broncos. to go off on the fucking whatever, but it's true. I no. mean, because of you, I got into an acting class. Because of you, I did what you said. You know, three out of ten comics are going to have a pension. Yeah. Three out of ten comics walk around with no insurance. Yeah. You know, three, because they never really thought of the acting side. No. I didn't want to be an actor. I didn't start off to be an actor, but I thought it would be a valuable tool in my tool shed. Yeah. I knew that somewhere or another it would help me on stage. Well, it makes you a better stand-up. Makes you a better stand-up when you act. And then comes the day when you incorporate your stand-up into your acting, yeah. and now your acting becomes a fucking... Like, I don't do a lot of things good. I don't fuck good. I may not be able to cook a fucking steak. But I will tell you what I'm very good at is going into a room yeah. with four people in it and fucking them up. Yeah. And it's because of the original room. I yeah. give that credit to the original room and co-reading workshops. Yeah. You combine that together. And you got something special. <clears throat> you have something I mean, special. Because, dude, I look at all the, all the roles I've done. I got a lot of fucking roles. And it was just going in straight up auditioning. I didn't know anybody. I didn't have a fucking famous uncle. I didn't have a famous dad. I mean, you had to go in with 380 other fucking actors and do the best fucking reading you could. The competition side of that got me fucking excited. I mean, there was, a, there was, a, there was about six months with me and Billy Gardell. If I didn't get the job, he got the job. If I didn't get the job, he got the job. I got the job. He didn't get the job. But for six months, we were going for the same stuff. And then one time, we are just coming around the corner of Warner Brothers, and he comes around the corner and goes, Schubert, how a god now? I go, but, you know, that friendly competition makes you better. It gets you, you know what I mean? I mean, if I didn't get it, I want to know if my friend got it. But I, but like you said, that that, that acting stuff. I so. never, I, ne I knew when I first got here, I cannot lie to you or to the audience. When I first got here, I had a mental competitive naturally but to succeed I had to eliminate people as competition and yeah. make them my comrades yeah because you, you're competing against yourself so That's what, what I, I do yeah. usually what I did for years was when I get an audition I made as a cosmic karma thing for me yeah. I would call somebody who was my type and say did you get a call for this uh, and they would go no I didn't you gave me call, a couple calls call like your that. agent yeah even though I wanted that role, I would call people just for the karmic energy. That's great. To let people know that, because you don't know what they're looking for. I'm the same way. You don't want to give me the job? Don't give it to me, but give it to Lee. Yeah. You don't want to give it to Lee? Let's give it to the Agostino. Yeah. You don't want to give it to the Agostino? Let's give it to fucking Rogan. You don't want to give it to Rogan? Let's give it to Hinchcliffe. Yeah. But you're going to give it to somebody in my family. Yeah, you got to give it to somebody. You're anyway. going to give it to somebody in my family. Yeah. And that's how I thought when I went into those auditions. Well, that was, I eliminate everybody. I got no competition in this town. Yeah. I don't I have no ill will to no comic anything at I all. I agree with you. I always feel when Lee gets a special, I just got up. I feel the because same I way. hang out with Lee. I just got up. That yeah. means I just got up. My friends' wins are my wins. Are my wins. And you have to have that attitude. And if and, you and, don't in this town, you'll fucking you. When I see a hater, we rot like a piece of fruit from the inside out. When I see a hater, I giggle. Because I know they have no future. Yeah. They just signaled out their own future themselves. Yeah. I told him one day, these open micers you hang out with, you go to lunch with them afterward, I don't want you hanging out with them. Yeah. Because they don't know what they're talking about. And they're hating the same way I hated at that level. Yeah, but Because you know, at that level I hated because yeah. you don't have what you want. It so your frustration. Not... It's hate brought on by frustration. Yeah. Now, when I go for an audition, the first guy calls Nick Turturro. Nick, you going out for this pizza guy? No, I didn't. You know, I, call, I would call Vinny Curdo. I would call uh, another friend of mine. That yeah. Me and him started together. A mafia role, I'd rather you get it if I don't yeah. get it. Yeah. You know, I'd rather one of my friends get it. So Absolutely. That helps you as a 
karma level. Yeah, because you know what? People are worried so much about getting the fucking job, they can't actually go into the room and be who they can't <coughs> be the because they're trying to give them something what they think they're looking for. You got to go in and not give a fuck about any of that shit. All, only thing you care about what you do in the audition. It doesn't look, I'm already going in. Look, if I get the job, great. If I don't, fine. I'm no, fucking attached. What do I lose? Yeah, I'm still going to Minneapolis. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I'm exactly. doing what I was meant to put on this earth. That's exactly The acting right. is a fucking cherry on the Sunday. That's right. That's exactly. It's a cherry on the Sunday. <laughs> yeah. So I don't give a fuck if I get it or not. It don't matter to me. I started as a dirty comic. That's what I am. Yeah. Everything else is background music. I know for a fact, like, and I tell people this, I don't want you to be an actor. Yeah, but I'm a stand-up. I just want you to have the tools. Yeah. So if they do call you, you don't look like a fucking Johnny Jerkoff. Yeah, and they will call. And they will call. Eventually, yeah. somebody's going to call you one day, and you're going to look like Johnny Jerkoff. Because you didn't do the work. You, because you didn't do the work, and then you're going to blame it on them, and then be, it's like when I first went to the South to do comedy. They don't like you in the Bible Belt. They didn't like me in the Bible Belt. I'll never come back. That's what a loser says. Right. A winner says, I'm going to go back there and make them love me. Yeah. I got to slow down my ass. It's like Elvis bit. in Vegas, bro. Right. Let them fall in love with me first. I can't go for the finger bang. Yeah. I got to kiss them in the neck and tell them I love them. <laughs> tell them I love that song you wrote. That's right. I love when you sing barefoot. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> And then you go for the finger. Yeah, that's it. And it's like a fucking finger bang. No, but, it, but, it, but it's, you know, and I, I got to tell you, I've always, I feel obligated to, like, you know, guys are coming out, they don't get that. I always feel obligated to help because you know how many people did that for me? Like, people fucking took me aside and said, hey, you got to do this, 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 and, and all those things. And uh, and over the years, this cumulative help that people would give you, and I feel obligated to fucking pass it along to my friends, the people I think that are worthy, that have ability, that have talent, that, you know, like you said, I'm, I'm not, I'm the lit last guy to get envious or bitter or jo- I, fucking, I, don't I, fucking, I don't have it in my heart I don't, have, the time I don't have it in my heart man I root for fucking everybody I root more for the guy on stage that he is you know because it doesn't make it who it is Some, there's somebody that, that, you know they put the work in they've been doing it 20 fucking years I mean I think only another comedian realized the, the effort and the tenacity and the fucking grit and the guts it takes to hang in there even when you think it's all going wrong and still believe in yourself and still do it and still bang it away and then you fucking look back and sometimes it's ours you know, I don't stop sometimes just breathe I have to look all the way back wow look at all the shit you were able to do look at all the stuff you have sometimes you're gonna stop and <coughs> give yourself credit I just saw you in that movie the other night what's that I've been thinking about you for a month oh that month? because I saw you three times in the matter of a couple of weeks I what? saw you in Oak King of Queens right I saw you I saw you in Mr. and Mrs. Smith yeah about two weeks ago, and I go, yeah. I got to call Schubert. Yeah. It was two in the morning. I, yeah. You're the type of guy I could call. I don't give a fuck. Right, that's right. <laughs> that's you know, right. I call you. You're the East Coast guy. Yeah. If you're sleeping, you're sleeping. Who gives a fuck? That's right. I was thinking about you. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. Just don't I did that freaking, uh, did that uh, American Nightmares on. Uh, uh, I was on the uh, Cinemax. Uh, I was on now. It's on demand. But Danny, people have no idea. Danny Trejo's in it. When Fox. Go was being filmed. When Go was being cast. Yeah. How much heat that movie had already from the script yeah like when that script came out everybody was trying to go out for the movie go yeah. there's certain movies that come out in this town everybody's that trying to people get people know and every i mean everybody was getting into go yeah i still remember having a specific conversation with a comic saying that he called the managing office and the manager wanted to sign him and that he gave an ultimatum I'll sign with you, but you got to get me in for go. Like that's how big people knew it was going to be. Scott Wolf, Jay Moore, yeah, and uh, the, Kate, Kate, was, uh, uh, the young girl that's cuter than fuck. She was dating Doug Lyman at the time. Sarah Polly, Sarah Polly, uh, Katie Holmes, Katie Holmes, Katie Holmes, or Bill Fickner was in it. Uh, the girl uh, from uh, Allie McBeal, the blonde girl, was uh, what's her name? She was on also on the Thirty Rock. Um, yeah, it had a fucking amazing cast in it. Tay Diggs was in it. Uh, you know, there was a, there was a it's a big cast. The little English guy from fucking yeah, Desmond Escu. Yeah, Desmond yeah, Escu Desmond was Escu. great. I mean, you know, hung up. But uh, Jimmy Duval, Jimmy Duval, who also wound up being in, in the movie I did on Cinemax, where I ran over, what the fuck are you doing here, Jimmy Duval? But uh, he was in it. That that and uh, yeah, it was crazy, man. That that kind of like really kind of. Really kind of solidified. I didn't realize how big that fucking movie was. It came out and went against the Matrix. It's a cult classic. It made like nineteen million over the summer, probably like, probably more now worldwide. But it was a great fucking ensemble cast to be part of. The Doug Gleiman, he also put me in fucking Mr. and Mrs. Smith there for. But I mean, you get these little fucking jobs, these little things, and like you said, dude, 
Well, the guy who played my dad, Screaming Freeman, I used to call him. He played the Dane in fucking Miller's Crossing. He was a fucking. Yeah, that yeah. guy was the coolest fuck, like this old fucking Marine. And we were in his fucking trailer, and he says, You smoke pot? I go, Yeah, I smoke pot. So we started, we smoked a little pot. He started giving me acting lessons. Like, you know, when you're filming over your shoulder, you take your left eye, you put it against my left eye, so open yourself up to camera. Give me like five or six great little fucking cheats. And I'm fucking high. And, I, and then they, Are you guys ready for it? Oh, shit. I was. <laughs> And it was just a pickup shop, and it freaked me out. I ran out. I rented fucking five movies just to look at, you know, all of my favorite actors just to study them and shit. And he goes, and ever since then, ever on the movies, that when I want to get high, you go, they called it acting lessons. You want to get some acting lessons after the fucking martini shot. But these guys, but he kind of took me under his arm and kind of told me about these things, and we worked out these scenes. And it was so great to have a guy like that doing your first big movie, and the guy's kind of giving you all these little inside cheats on how to be a better fucking actor and stuff. Because you think as a comedian, you're always kind of playing to the back, you know? But film just registers thought, so you want to keep it tight. And that was a nothing scene I did, but I never did it again for the rest of the movies. Like, I came in there serious and prepared to work, and I said, well, I would only do it after we get done doing our... It's really weird, the people we've... Like, the, the guy that gave me acting advice the first time ever, and he didn't give me bad advice. Like, he just fucking tore into me about it, it was James Coburn. James Coburn. How fucking weird is that? How great is that, though? <laughs> James Coburn, bro. That's old school shit, though. That's cool as fuck. Like, I didn't say nothing to him. I got there. I shook his hand. Alan Stevens got me the job. You know, James Coburn, I shook his hand. How you doing? Nice to meet you. I didn't say nothing. He goes, you want to run this once or twice? Yeah, let's run it once or twice. We did it. And he goes, look at my fucking hands. Because he had arthritis and right. shit. And then we just fucking rehearsed the scene. And then we were doing it. And while we were doing it, he said to me that I had natural instincts. Like, this is when they're moving the cameras around you. Yeah. And you're standing there like Johnny Jerkoff. Yeah. And you're standing three feet from the fucking greatest baddest motherfucker on the of planet. all time. And yeah. you're trying to keep it together. You studied with Bruce Lee. Yeah. Study with Bruce, Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee dude. He was one, one of Bruce Lee's mourners. He carried the casket. I know. Shit. Just, I, you don't even want to bring it up. Like, the first dad didn't say nothing. Uh, the first dad didn't say nothing. I took his advice. He goes, Are you in acting class? I go, Yeah. He goes, Get the fuck out of it because they're going to ruin your natural instincts. Wow. I go, Done. The Who next, did you start with, Jimmy DiStefano? At first, yeah. Jimmy DiStefano. You remember Jimmy? I took a couple classes from Jimmy DiStefano. <laughs> the first guy I signed with was a guy that was very good. He just hated comedians because he had a bad taste. Dice. This guy was over on Gardner and Sunset. And when he found out I was a comic, he worked me hard. Right. And then one night I said to him, what the fuck is your problem? Because he's a New York guy. Right. And he goes... I was one of the first guys to ever work with Andrew Dice Clay, and he fucked me over on uh, on the movie he made. Or Making the Grand or whatever it was? No, the big one, the Cadillac one, whatever. The one, oh, in well, the height uh, of his, Fort Fairlane. Yeah, yeah, something happened with him and Dice. So he goes, I fucking hate stand-up comics. The class was on Monday nights. So Monday nights was the hottest night in L.A. in those times. You had Latino Night at the Laugh Factory yeah. and the fucking show at the Improv, Freaky yeah. Mondays. How am I going to... So I would always have to do my scene and leave. Frank Magna. That was my first acting teacher. I did not book anything with him. I did not get what the fuck he was saying. Yeah. Then I did a black guy that had HIV. He was over on Gower in those little huts. Yeah. In between Sunset and Hollywood Boulevard. Right. Some comic took me there. But I just thought of his face. He's way long gone. He's somewhere married. Right. He took me there to a class on Saturday, and I fell in love with the guy. And that guy taught me. That's who I had when I got the call back with Billy Gardell for the Travolta movie. Right. The one about the fucking the, the singer. Right. It was me and Billy Gardell there that morning. All co I was all coked up. Oh, wow. And me and Billy are sitting there. And it's a director from Drugstore Cowboy and Travolta were in the room. And me and Billy had a read. It was either going to be me or Billy. Wow. And then they said, fuck it. We'll make them both stand-up comics. So me and Billy were up for the same fucking role. And next thing you know, Gatlin goes, you got this. Go to Miami. And when I was in Miami, I got a call. Travolta decided to do the Scientology movie instead. Oh, wow. So the kiss of Billy Gardell even bit me in the ass at that time. Because Billy was kicking ass at that time. Yeah. 
Billy had just booked four episodes of that law show. He oh, had yeah. his own show on NBC. He got paired up. Yeah, with no, he was in the, the, the black dude that wasn't any good. Billy Gardell was booking, but everything he booked was wrong for him. Like it was just like a stretch of Billy just ha was having a hard time. He was booking, but it then he booked four episodes of that, of that Law and Order. Yeah, with no yeah. the show on ABC on Sunday nights that was huge. That the guy built the studio down in uh, Orange County. You had to go down to Huntington Beach to audition down the block from Boston Market. They only shot four shows down there. He 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 had so many. Sh he was married to Michelle Pfeiffer or somebody. Oh, David. Uh, yes, he had so many shows going on at the time. Yeah, yeah. He just told ABC, I'm not leaving Huntington Beach. Yeah. Build the studio they down were all, here. There were all four sh so shows. So they would shoot down all there. four of his shows down yeah. there. Wow, what was his last name? David Lee, maybe? David something. Yeah, but you're right. He was he was right, he was right Natalie McBeal. Right, 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 right. right. He had like four wall. fucking shows at once, yeah. dog. He was rocking it. Yeah. And he shot his show out of there, and I'm, I'll never forget that. That was the same week that I was going in for Spider. I went all week. I would go down there and I'd see Billy Gardell and go, God, fucking damn it. <laughs> but they were looking for three different mobsters, four different mobsters. So we all had a shot. Right. And every time I get to the nice callback, fucking Billy Gardell was there. <laughs> well, it's good, though. It's a good competition. And I'm like, no, but it wasn't a competition. Yeah. I'm like, fuck, the kiss is death that's here. Because at the time, Billy was the kiss of death. Everything he fucking was in would get canceled wow. or was always a bad role. Billy shot, before Billy got that show on CBS. Dude, he was in Lucky. He Billy was, was Lucky. He, he was in no the show. was the other, the John, the, the Anthony Clark and um, the Anthony Clark show. We did like fucking probably like 13 episodes of that show with uh, Anthony Clark and uh, Mike, 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 Michael Malley. Mike O'Malley, they were on that show before King of Queens on CBS. Yeah, he had yeah, Billy had a, Billy's had a great fucking career acting. Great Mike O'Malley, he's done. He was in the you know he's in the, the manager in the, the Jersey Boys. I mean he's you know Billy's worked a lot. Billy gets it, you know. Great kid too. Yeah. Didn't happen to a better fucking guy. Yeah, he's no question great, about. But it. he was struggling for a long. Time. Well, everybody is until you get those first couple breaks and stuff. Dude, I was doing La Jolla. Listen to this, bro. I'm doing fucking La Jolla. I get a call Saturday at five p.m. Can you do this fucking movie from our boy Rick Bronson, who runs the fucking clubs? He goes, I got to go shoot me. I got this director. He needs somebody. He's in. The, he's in fucking. Idaho. Uh, Idaho Falls. Did you shoot that? Dude, yes, you were supposed to get yes. it. Yes. You couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. I so was they, in West they, Palm Beach so on Sunday. They call you Friday. How great's this? So he calls me Saturday and says, can you be on a plane on fucking Sunday? I flew up Sunday, and they, they fucking got the got the hotel, the plane ticket, everything's right. I fucking all, all day shooting with Hopper Penn, Sean Penn's son, in this fucking movie that's already had five or six offers on it uh, called Puppy Fucking Love. The director, Michael Maxis, is a great fucking guy. We great guy. Great shoot guy. all this fucking stuff, and that scene frames the movie. It's in the beginning movie. It's all throughout the movie. It's all these little stories. It's probably going to premiere at South by Southwest, but that was a role that you were supposed to fucking do. He, they wanted you. He, he goes, called me Friday. He called you and he called me Saturday. And I, I go, I'm going to have to thank Joey Diaz for not being able to do it. I was it. in West Palm Beach. They yeah. called me Friday. They made an offer Friday. I thought about it. I go, so when do you need me? They go, Monday. I had 20 things on Monday. Yeah. No, I get it. I was it, just about to sell that show to Fox. Yeah. Like, I'm right there. Like, I had those meetings with writers. I had a... Yeah, I had something, and I had something that Monday, because when they first called me, they said we could shoot it Monday or Tuesday, the latest. There was something going on still, and I go, yeah. Monday is going to be hard, but Tuesday. So I would have had a flown from West Palm to oh, L.A. Right. Change was, shit. It's eleven pages of dialogue too. It was a fucking. It was a, like a monster where they were. I was like, I was oh shit. I mean that that yeah. whole night I got there of Saturday. Well, I flew in Saturday Sunday night and I was just fucking working on those lines the whole thing. And he was great about it. And he goes, I guess, you know, he goes, I needed somebody to anchor the scene. So I mean, I wasn't his first choice, but it didn't make a difference. I got the role. I meant to. I meant to thank you for that too because I go, you know, it's it's. Uh, Shit, man! You know, you, you, it's uh, the movie's already a kick-ass fucking movie. These scenes were just reshoots for 
him so he could get the fuck because he wants to fucking premiere it. He's been editing it for a year and a half with Sean Penn and fucking Michael Matson, Roseanne Arquette, fucking Wayne Newton. There's a bunch of fucking cool fucking soundtrack things in it. It's a killer. It's like Forrest Gump except the other direction where the life guy, where Forrest Gump has an amazing, spectacular life. This guy's life is filled with freaking, you know, uh, hookers and crack pipes and fucking all this shit in another direction. It's and puppy love is such a dist- like such a fucking like it doesn't. But I'm telling you, the guy is a fucking great movie director. It was great to work with him, Michael Maxis, and I think this movie is going to be a big fucking deal. It's, it reminds me of Go. It's the same kind of vibe as like Go, but this guy. And so yeah, it was a plane to Utah, another flight to Idaho Springs where I got a warrant. Yeah, and then I had to drive for an hour. Oh yeah. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. I got a bad back as it is. Plus the f- six hours from West Palm up. Yeah. That would have been a whole day of flying. Yeah, I'm, dude. I'm I, I, fucking yeah, old. You know what, dude? It is. And I had the it, thing on Monday, but I'm happy you got it. Yeah, I'm happy. It, I'm happy. Just what we were talking, talking about. I know. That's what I'm saying. I was just, it, dude, it was fucking karma because it was like one of those things because, like, you know, <clears throat> it came at the right time for me. And I just, yeah, just fuck yeah. You can, why, what do I got to lose? Yeah, I could do it. I could, they let me out of the show on a Sunday night at the, at the La Jolla, which they never used to do a Sunday night show down there before. But now I guess they're cooking with gas. So they do thir- it's the Friday, Saturday, Sunday show. So they let me out of it went to fucking idaho falls got the fucking part worked on it all day then yeah, hung out with fucking sean penn's kid hopper penn we hung out went out for drinks afterwards and then just jumped on a fucking plane flew to philadelphia where i did spark the parks casino to the wednesday night so i literally had that gap sunday how till great Monday. is the parks casino it's great it's great. It's Are right there, Ben Sell. I did it. That, that's seven minutes from my mom and dad's house. That park is That's a neighbor I grew up in out there. Yeah. Are you serious? Yeah, dude. I love it. That is. That was tremendous. Yeah. That was. I'm going back next year. Yeah, it's a great concern. Like I'm going back. They all made an offer, and I said, absolutely. Yeah. Like, I loved it. I loved everything about that. Yeah. The drive there, everything was sensational. Because yeah. you land, you got to drive. The guy took me there for some cheese shake place, and I didn't even know. And yeah. Then, you get there. What was it, Steve? Prince of Steaks up there in front of Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, dude, you got to take a hot shower. That's the, one of the best cheesesteaks ever. It's right around the corner from Parks, and it's like this real gooey. But they use the real, like, cuts, like like thin cuts of, like, prime rib. It's, like, delicious. It's, like, one of the best best steaks I've ever had. It's Steve Prince of Steaks, which is about five minutes from where that joint is, Parks Casino. Tremendous. No, yeah. no I, thought, I, I thought Parks Casino, that was where I fucking just got off the stage and went into the audience. They were that crazy. Yeah. Like I didn't even go in the green room. They're big fans of Joey. Yeah, but they're my fucking, nephews listen to your food. They're, they're crazy. Yeah, they're crazy. Everybody Philadelphia's fucking... crazy. That's why I love it. That's why I belong there. Like whenever yeah. I go there, I go say some crazy shit. I, I watch. <laughs> I watch Eleanor on stage talking about getting fingered on the Morty's Pier. I almost puked. You were laughing so hard. Yeah, what's Morty's Pier? Oh, it's down in Wildwood, New Jersey. Everybody goes down the shore. It's like one of those things. It's like, you know, it's uh, it, it's like such a, everybody goes down the shore. Everybody went down to Wildwood, New Jersey for the summertime. You come down there, you know, my grandmother would pawn her jewelry so she could get enough money so we'd go down to fucking shore for two weeks as kids and we would go down there and spend time in like, you know, Longport or fucking. So know. where's Morty's Pier? In Morty's Pier is Wildwood? down in Wildwood. Yeah, it's like, you know, wow. down Wildwood and, you know, all those fucking, you know, all those freaking. Wow, 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 days. That's like part of Philadelphia culture. The mummers, scrapple, all that Philadelphia shit, soft pretzels, fucking wild woods, every bit of part of that. Go, let's go down to the boardwalk and play, play, play the shoot, shooty shoots for a quarter. I got us a fucking case of shave, but I'm like drinking shave for beer. Or like, you know, when you were a kid growing up and the boardwalk and all that shit comes flooding back and she got finger banged underneath Morty's Pier. <laughs> fucking wild days. When she yeah. said that, I lost my shit. I oh, didn't dude, even know what Morty's fun. Pier was. How funny is fucking Eleanor Kerrigan? dude she's fucking rocking dude. what a she's, success story i love it dude i love that she you know i i mean she's fucking really tremendously uh fucking talent but to watch her go from the, the the waitress of the comedy store to fucking doing a wwe and the stuff and they actually go open for dice and how strong she's become as a as a comedian now is like a fucking sister to me man i fucking love her to death her she's also. a she's a sweetheart she's got I, a card of gold with all her success you know? yeah me too i mean i but i mean she, i just love watching somebody like her get so fucking good and so funny and dude she's fucking my to follow her one time she was working with me in la jolla she just fucking slaughters slaughter. i mean dude i love it i'd love it dude jimmy can you believe 30 years you're doing this 
I know. It's a fucking... 30 uh, what? Five? 30, no, 30 fucking years. 30 years. I mean, make a living like a professional. I mean, it could have gone either way. I could have gone... I would have had doves up my ass and out of my sleeves. I could have gone into magic, but I went into fucking comedy. And, I, and like you, I feel this is exactly where I'm supposed to be. I mean, I love making a room full of people fucking laugh, whether there's a thousand people or 200 people or 14 fucking people. I don't give a shit. I love it. I love being able to create comedy. I love being able to take control of a room and just make people laugh so that they fucking piss themselves. I mean, there's nothing better than that. I mean, you know, you know, people come up when people come up to you and go, they grab me by the arm and say, "I haven't fucking laughed like that in so long. I fucking needed that." I mean, you know, I don't ever take that for granted. I fucking, I just to be able to do that is a fucking gift, and to be able to touch people and move people with your fucking jokes and something you created and write comedy and you don't know there's somebody in the audience thinking about killing themselves. Maybe they lost their favorite aunt. Maybe something's going on in life, and they come in there and sit in front of you, in front of you for forty five minutes. You to make them laugh and before you know it they forget about all that shit and they walk out and going god damn it that's real power and it's healing and it's fucking everything i fucking love and i just dude it just feeds my soul and I'm, i believe i'm exactly what i'm supposed to be doing making people laugh jimmy schubert i feel in my heart you wanted the 10 top comics working today uh, dude, that's, that's fucking awful that. nice of you to say that bro I all the confidence in my heart i can tell you that because i know what you've been through you know i watch these guys that think this is a fly-by-night business Nobody pisses me off more than these fly-by-night comics. <clears throat> they get the comedy for all the wrong reasons. Yeah. You know, you're a guy that, this is 30 years. Yeah. You take every year how it comes. And I get better and better with Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. No, imagine. Doing, I mean, yeah. Imagine doing this for 30 fucking years. You're going to get good at it. Dude. Eventually, if you do the same move for 30 years, hammer and nails, Dude. you're going to get really good at it. I feel the same way. Dude, watching fucking you, and I remember, I remember all the fucking old nights at the fucking original room and the fucking, you know, and watching you go up there and fucking annihilate, bro. You are the most authentic fucking voice in front of God. Dude, I watch you do the fucking, just fucking slaughtering your fucking hilarious you're authentic you are true to who you are and you're doing it's the same thing man it's like fucking you watch guys who put the time in and pay the dues and you just go man it's fucking amazing you know we're talking about getting booed and i got booed at a buffalo hockey game, <laughs> the same of, the game. of all the fucking places to get booed at hockey you know it's 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 those things that you remember forever like, yeah i don't I, mad tv was a great experience for me yeah do i wear like a badge of honor no i did two episodes right. but i tell you what I wear that bombing in Buffalo like a bad at Giovanna because it made me who I am today. Yeah. Those bombings, those beatings, oh. they either take you out of the game Dude. or you come back with a roast beef sandwich with horseradish and <laughs> suck my dick and call me shorty. They get booed by 10,000 people. They get booed by 10,000 people in front of my fucking mom and dad in my hometown. It was like fucking you lifting the kettle off the fucking Shaolin temple, and now you can leave because there's nothing you're ever going to do to me in a fucking comedy room or a comedy place or anything that fucking, that was as bad as fucking that, getting booed in your fucking hometown or from your friends. Like, yeah, you can't do anything to me in a fucking comedy club that's going to hurt me like that. You can't, I'm not fucking nothing. I got fucking six brothers. My old man was a homicide detective. I got one feeling, and I fucking dare you to hurt it. You know what I mean? I mean it's like, you know what I mean? When you go through, you do. You wear those things with a badge of honor. It's like, I can't, you can't do anything to me. It's like, you know, it's, but it, but it's great. You got to get those, those, the, it's like you said, all those, all those uh, worst nights, and they're the things that build up your, you know what I mean? Like you said, you wear those with a badge. I mean, all the wins are great too, but still. You know? Those bombings are great. The special you come out, you shot at Flappers. Yeah. When did you shoot it? About last year? Yeah, I shot it about a year and a half ago. And, um, you know, we had to like, do all the posts for it, do the color correction. I, I, I financed the whole thing myself. I did the whole fucking thing, top to bottom myself. I got the guys to shoot it. We went in there. We hung curtains, hung lights. I just wanted to go in there. And we shot it in 4K. It's called uh, Zero Tolerance. And it's a fucking straight up fucking hour of fucking stand up comedy. We can come up with a cool little opening for I it. I really like the opening. Yeah, it because the, open, it, well, the opening is just a fucking like, you know, it's like in this day and age, like the things people get fucking upset about now, it's like you're overreacting to all this shit. That's why that kind of like, diffuses the bomb you know you're you know, it was being censored by social media and and uh, oversensitized is being expurgated by the political correctness police it was like that that opening is just like yeah fuck it it's comedy man i mean jesus dude i was watching rodney dangerfield on like an old youtube thing i went down a rodney dangerfield rabbit hole and i go man if this motherfucker was alive today we'd do it. he's fat shaming people i mean you could you couldn't even fucking be rodney dangerfield today i mean dude i fucking 
it's just it's just funny like some of the stuff you see like do you think Kinnison could get away with the stuff he was doing back then I mean it still holds up but I mean just with the climate and how sensitive people have become it's fucking ridiculous I, I'm 56 years old February 19th right if you think I give a fuck about your feelings anymore yeah you got another thing coming I'm gonna talk to you what's in my heart yeah you know? it's so fucking weird that I don't give a fuck yeah I'm with you I don't Give and I ain't fuck. apologize for I'm fucking anything you do. It's like, fuck you. It's like, you know. <clears throat> the thing that we love the most is going to kill us. And that's social media. You know, I, I use social media for something completely different. Yeah. I don't involve my political thoughts. I don't, I don't involve my views or my opinions. I involve what I'm thinking. Yeah. And I want you to think what I'm thinking today. If you want to make it through today, yeah. you better fucking go drink some cough medicine, take a Vicodin, grab your fucking ball, salute the flag, yeah. and go be a fucking American and go hustle. Yeah. But if you're going to sit there on your ass and bitch, I don't want you around me. Yeah. I really don't. There's a formula, and it works. Dude, I'm fucking with It you. works, bitch. Yeah. It yeah. works. It's yeah. called washing your pussy and getting out of the fucking house and doing what you fucking love until you figure out how to make a buck doing it. Yeah. And if you don't want to do that, then lay on that couch and you could cry to anybody the fuck else. That's what I put on there in the mornings. I tell you my dates and I get the fuck out of there. I don't need to take a picture of a celebrity. I don't need to show you my fucking diet. Yeah. I show you what I'm smoking. Yeah. Because I want you to know what the recipe is. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Well, yeah, I'll show man. you what I'm smoking. Fucking Joey Diaz, life coach. Now, like, yeah. now you get these people that go to a comedy show. They, 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 listen, social media has just become, you know, when I go on social media on a Saturday just to look at the climate, yeah. and I see those same people tweet, and I feel bad for them. Yeah, I feel bad for those people that tweet and put post on Friday. I want you to get off social media from Friday to Sunday. Yeah, go enjoy your go, life. Go live your life. Go live your life. Go There's have some experience. Life. To, yeah. I'm Lee, telling. Yana, New Year's. I told them right now. I go, if I was 30 years old, I'd give this pinky up right now to the Japanese. <laughs> for, the yeah, for New Year's? Yeah. I'd give this pinky up if I go out New Year's Eve to a bar. Be comfortable, do two bumps, and have three beers, and maybe take a Xanax and go home. I would have done that. I told him, Ali, do something. He cannot stay home. And he went and he made a call and some chick came over, some little victim. Nice. And licked his balls and the rest is history. You know what I'm saying? Whether he liked it or not. But you have to live your life. Yeah. I mean, like, you, you know. You cannot be stuck all day. Well, people do this. Like they fucking hashtags. They, they act like they're brave. He was so brave to hashtag it. I go, fucking go out and fucking. You know what I did on Christmas, dude? And it's the first time I've done this. I went down to the Laugh Factory and I fed those fucking homeless people all fucking afternoon. Because I didn't have nothing to do. I wasn't going to go home to my fish. I don't have kids. I was going through a fucking breakup. I'm going to fuck it. I'm going to go fucking. I went down there and. Are you and the Philly chicken done? Yeah, I mean, we're done. Jesus. Uh, but anyway, we're out there, you know, just feeding the homeless people and just, uh, you know, uh, I mean, it felt, I felt so fucking good doing it. And what I, did you I, get out of it? I just, I just, just thought I fucking. I'm not questioning you. I know as bad way. as I felt about my right, fucking right, right, life, right. I felt how fucking blessed I was. I fucking, I went home and I fucking thanked God for all my fucking you blessings. On stage? I got on stage, I told some jokes, we filled their bellies and then we filled their souls with entertainment. And I got to tell you, Jamie Masada, that guy, he does it on Thanksgiving, he does it on Christmas. It's tremendous, tremendous fucking act of kindness. It was, a, I felt fucking great just to be a part of it, just to get out of the house. And fucking Tiffany Haddish was there feel it, feeding people. And you know, these people don't have to do it. There's fucking Tom Drees and everybody's down there feeding people, making sure they had enough to eat. And then they went up on stage and gave them a show. And I thought, well, you, well one day you treat these people like fucking human beings i know this is fucking fantastic i mean if christmas ain't in your heart you ain't gonna find it underneath the fucking christmas tree so it was a really a really cool thing to do i'll do it every year now on thanksgiving christmas i thought it was tremendous and so but yeah but you get outside your own fucking shit you know and that's social media derives everybody they all think they're all caught up in their own bullshit i mean go fucking go down to the hospital and fucking read the fucking sick kids who ain't never getting the fuck out of that hospital or go feed some fucking homeless people or go go to the old i mean go do some real shit i always say that get outside of your fucking self if you're depressed you get outside of yourself you see how fucking lucky you got it you know and, you know but it, it's just uh i, I mean well, I, 
I, I'll, I'll be doing that again too on Thanksgiving. That's crazy just, what happened to me, dude. He, he, dude, he ran over a thousand people through there. A thousand people, fucking hosta, hungry people, just fucking having had a good meal. Not a good meal, but just fucking then, you know, we treat them like human beings in there. They were, hey, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas, give them a plate of food. Here, you watch a show. It was just for the kids coming in with toys. They had toys they could unwrap. It was fucking amazing, and he doesn't have to do that. He's been doing it for thirty nine years. I thought I was, I thought I was just a. It just, it just kind of fucking moved me, man. You know, I, I just thought it was something special. I was it's glad. Crazy. To be part. I had a couple of bums. What's that? A couple of twenties on Christmas Day. It was funny because Lee and I, and Eric <laughs> Rocha, went up to oh. Oxnard last weekend. Oh yeah. <laughs> we would always have to stop at the one hundred and one uh, by Tahunga and Magnolia right. Riverside. There's, there's homeless mm-hmm. people living under there, and me and I would beep the horn, and there was no, they weren't in there. They just weren't in there. Right. Oh, there was that shit was there, but they weren't there. I'm like Lee, open the window. I would open Lee's window and go, "Hey," and Lee would go, "Lock the window. We're gonna get killed here, whatever." And you make the right hand turn and you hit the one hundred and one. Right. Christmas Day, I got up and I was sitting there. And I'm like, oh, "What the fuck is going on in my life? I got, I got to take a ride anyway." And I got in the car and at, at that light, I finally saw the three homeless dudes. It's it's a black chick with a backpack. And two white dudes, and they were dressing up like teddy bears. They were trying to hustle teddy bears. So I just beeped the horn and gave them each a fucking 20 on Christmas Day. And every, the, the black chick looked at me like, take your dick out. Yeah. Like, I'll suck it for 20. I've been, I've been hustling for quarters, and you just can't. They had a Starbucks. They were happy. That's it. Yeah, I mean, that's you know. the best I could fucking do on Christmas. You know, I you mean, know what, bro? you, you know. gotta do something. You gotta do. You gotta help somebody on Christmas. I think so. It's that time of year. You know, I think you. You know, and you, you just sometimes people like if they if you reflect on your life and you look back, you go, God, I'm incredibly fucking blessed. Oh my I, God. I mean, you know, am I where I want to be? No, am I gonna keep working to where I want to yeah, be? Yeah, everybody but, wants to fucking, fucking be yeah, this. somewhere else. But you but just no. also sometimes be thankful for where you are. You're still alive, like my man's, like my old man says. You know, get up every morning because I'm a fucking happy. Just be awake on the fucking right side of the grass. You know, my old man's 85, you know, I'm still lucky enough to still have him, so I don't take any of that for granted either. I mean, you know, you just get to do something you love to do. You still got a, I got a great family. I mean, you know, fucking knock wood, man. God bless, you know. When's the special come on, Schubert? The special is going to be dropping on January 15th. If people go to jimmyschubert.com, and it's S-H-U-B-E-R-T, like the theater, jimmyschubert.com. It's going to be on Vimeo on Demand, but you can just go to my website. It'll take you on the Vimeo on Demand, and plus it'll be on Vimeo. But I'll be tweeting about it if people want to check out my uh, social media everything's at jimmy schubert at twitter and instagram and everything else there'll be a big announcements coming so if they follow me on social media or they want to check back january 15th which is a tuesday i'll be dropping my brand new hour special on vimeo on demand so they can rent it they can buy it they can do whatever they want with it but uh, uh i'm really excited about this hour i work my ass off on it and so it's finally coming out and i'm just going just going right to the people you like know? i tell people all the time you tom rhodes all you guys you guys are the backbones of comedy. I watch you guys, and I always learn something. Like, uh, and we're on the flip side of the coin, but the coin flips at any time. Yeah, you know it does. So, I wish you all the luck in the world. I thank you very much for helping me out when I got here. Dude, my because pleasure. It meant the world to me, and now I can do the same for Lee and other guys. I mean, I do. I you, understand you, that you have to pass it along. Part of this is not about talent. Yeah, it's about passing out love to somebody you, you know help who's people having a hard time yeah, yeah. fucking bobby lee tells a story he was with the back back at the comedy store he said he had it eaten in three fucking days I go well, what the fuck are you waiting for come on i fucking took him down to carnies i fucking shoved the hot dog down his throat i said get something to fucking go to you fuck i've been that guy i had to sleep on the fucking roof of the comedy store the fucking sleep in my car i had to crash a crestal i wasn't allowed up there he was trying to fucking hustle and make a living hang out till things got better i totally get it man it was my pleasure and that's my fucking pleasure to see you have this fucking huge success that you're having now i fucking love you joey diaz happy new year and thank you for having me on man thank you good luck to you too don't forget january 12th i'm at the fucking ice house just working out all the notes i've been doing the last two weeks are all coming out on the 12th come on by and say hello then at the end of the month the 20 something i don't know what fucking date it is the 24th i'm in bray improv the whole weekend it's the last weekend of january come on out and say hello i want to thank jimmy schubert for fucking rocking it and if Netflix ever does the five good guys of comedy, I hope you're on it because you're a really fucking good guy. Well, thank you, brother. I want to thank number one on it. Listen, it's January fucking third. You want to change your life. It all starts from within writing goals, walking, whatever little things you want to do. But 
At the same time, you could fucking go over to uh, Onnit.com and get the party started with either some Alpha Brain or some Shroom Tech there. Fucking Golden Seal is the Alpha Brain. You want to focus a little bit more fucking energy, Alpha Brain is the way to go. Listen, it's their fucking bread and butter. If you don't like it, they'll give you a refund and your money back without the fucking product. Only on it stands behind their fucking flagship product like that. So do me a favor. If they have that much belief, how much belief should you have? Go to onnit.com right now and press in. Church. And get 10% off your order. I can only help you with supplements. I cannot help you with kettlebells or fucking bats or anything like that. But you know what? Get them too. Who gives a shit? Number two, you want to start the year off healthy? You want to start the year off smelling clean? And nothing says I love you like a clean fucking asshole. You understand me? I bend you over. I open up those cheeks. I smell fumes of death. What do you expect? Nobody's going to lick your asshole. Everybody wants to lick your asshole, but nobody wants to wash it. That's why you got to go to hellotushy.com. Because they got portable bidets that you install in seven minutes. And now from the end of fucking time. Let me tell you something. When you die, the car is going to look at your asshole and go, let me tell you something. This guy's asshole was in good shape. Why? Because you got HelloTushy.com. Go to HelloTushy.com right now and press in. Muffler. Muffler. And keep your muffler clean. They got a 60-day money-back guarantee, but you're not going to need it. Because if it's held my fat, stinky ass for three years, think what it could do for your fucking regular fucking ass. Lee, have you broken your Hello Tushy? And no, it's still there. And if it could pump that hummus, fly swatting off his neck ass, it'll take anything. You understand me? With, I, I can't even imagine what Lee's shit They're going to put that like. on the box. The, the, fucking, the, fucking, the fucking hose taps out and shit. Now, everything's intact. Go to hellotushy.com and press in. Muffler. And get a portable bidet installed in your fucking house by you seven minutes. Because remember, hell starts in your asshole. <laughs> All right? And then you slip back a little bit and you wash the bat side of your nutsack so you don't develop any algae or... Or barnacles. I, I found the barnacle in my nutsack about four years ago. <laughs> Ever since I've been with Hello Tushy, no He's more fucking me, barnacles. <laughs> I had to go to a fucking ship welder's yard to weld the barnacle off my nutsack. <laughs> go to HelloTushy.com and press in. Muffler. Bam! And get that asshole fresh by Valentine's Day. You understand me? I want to thank Jimmy Two Shoes Schubert. Go to JimmySchubert.com for a special. I want to thank the Christ Killer. And I want to thank you guys. For being loyal soldiers and for always loving me as much as I love you. Kick this fucking mule, Lee. See you guys Monday morning, ready to rock the 7th of January when this shit really gets cooking. Do your thing, Lee.